I'd like to begin uh, uh, by expressing my gratitude uh, to the organizers, uh, the sponsors, and hosts of this conference for the opportunity to honor the legacy of Antonino Forte, whose studies in the transmission of Buddhism in Asia and beyond has inspired us all. What has most inspired me about Forte's scholarship is his attention not simply to the in and beyond of Asian Buddhist transmission, but to the in-betweenness of it, his abiding interest in the interstices of Asian Buddhist histories, in the activities at the Chinese court of a Persian aristocrat, a Sinhalese alchemist, a Brahmin born in China, or a tantric master from Kashmir, to draw just a few examples from his publications, has redefined Buddhist studies as an intellectual pursuit at once transnational and transcultural, and long before such terms were fashionable or perhaps even coined. So my offering is presented in homage to Forte's relentless pursuit of cultural outsiders, intellectual in-betweeners, and the multiple and unexpected trajectories in the transmission of Buddhism. So here we go. In Kyoto, uh, did that move my... Huh. Okay. Uh, in Kyoto in the year 1710, a Kagon monk named Hotan produced the first Japanese Buddhist map of the world ever published. Entitled A Handy Map of the Myriad Countries of Jambudvipa, this enormous and detailed map measures nearly four by five feet and is composed of nine woodblock sheets. Lake Anavatapta is depicted at the center of the world and four great rivers, the Ganges, the Indus, the Oxus, and the Sita, flow from the mouths of four animals, encircle the lake, and extend to the four corners of the world. The immediate source for this telling topographic detail, as well as for all of the place names and landforms of Central Asia and India, is the great Tong record of Western regions, the account by the Chinese monk Xuanzang, whom we just heard about, of his seventh century pilgrimage to the land of Buddhist origins. In Paris, in the year 1836, a French edition of this Japanese map was published. It appeared in the first European language translation of Fashian's record of Buddhist kingdoms and was entitled, A Map of India After the Chinese with the itinerary of Xuanzang indicated with a dotted line. The French version of the map maintains the axial lake, the four great rivers, and the toponymy and topography of Xuanzang's record. The translation of Fashian's record and of Xuanzang's map was the work of Jean-Pierre Abel Remissat and uh, Julius von Klaproth. Remusat and Klaproth, the academic ancestors of Sinology and Buddhist studies in Europe, much like their latter-day descendant, whose legacy this conference honors, transformed the study of East Asian Buddhism in the West. Today, I would like to follow this little-known example of the transmission of Buddhism in Asia and beyond to ask what this curious moment in the history of cartography can tell us about the development of Buddhist studies in the West. Hotan's map was the result of a thousand years in the East Asian study and veneration of Xuanzang's pilgrimage and of centuries of transcription, experimentation, and innovation by Japanese monks. It also served as the handmaiden or perhaps the midwife to the birth of Buddhist studies in Europe. A history of this unique cartographic object thus requires us to move in two temporal directions backward from the 18th century to uncover the map's East Asian past and forward into the 19th century to explore its European future. It is a history that reveals not only how a 7th century Chinese account of Buddhist India was envisioned in 18th century Japan, but also the implications of this Japanese vision 
for the European understanding of Buddhism. Hotan's map is deeply indebted to a manuscript tradition of Japanese maps that traced and retraced the route of Xuanzang's pilgrimage. Indeed, the earliest extant Japanese map of the world produced in the 14th century is based exclusively on Xuanzang's pilgrimage and has a bright red line marking the route of his journey. This 14th century map continued to be reproduced in manuscript copies made by Buddhist monks in the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th century. The copyist of one such example wrote along the right-hand margin these words. In making this copy, I feel as if I have traveled to India. So in tracing the route of Xuanzang's pilgrimage, a Japanese monk living a thousand years after the Tang pilgrim felt as if he too had traveled to the Buddhist holy land. It was for him and for other monastics who copied and venerated the map in various temple complexes, both a devotional object and a ritual means of reenacting by quite literally retracing Xuanzang's journey. But Hotan did more than draw on this tradition of pious transcription. He radically transformed it as well. By incorporating Europe, here you see the detail called out on the screen, and the Americas into the margins of the Buddhist world. If Hotan's map reaches back to earlier manuscripts devoted to Xuanzang's pilgrimage, it also engendered a tradition of printed maps that extended to Europe. Less than two years after its initial publication, Hotan's map was redrawn and reproduced in the most popular encyclopedia of the Edo period, Tedajima Ryoan's Wakan Sansai Sui. In this encyclopedia, Tedajima included the same uh, Matteo Ricci style world map that Wang Qi published a century earlier in his Sansai Du Hui. The Sansai Du Hui was the Chinese model for the Wakan Sansai Sui. But Terajima also includes the central section of Hotan's map entitled A Map of the Western Regions and the Five Regions of India. From Moscovia in the Northwest to Mount Lanka in the Southeast, Terajima's map of Asia relies entirely on Hotan's map of Jambudvipa. The divisions of the five regions of India, the names and sizes of its many kingdoms, and the four great rivers spiraling from its center all derive from the classic account of Xuanzang's pilgrimage. It was in the form of this simplified redrawn book illustration, buried in the middle of a 107 volume Japanese encyclopedia, that Hotan's vision of the Buddhist world reached a European audience. The direct source for Demusat and Klaproth's map of India was not Hotan's original map of 1710, but rather the abbreviated version of it published in Terajima's Encyclopedia of 1712. But how did a Frenchman and a German in 19th century Paris get their hands on a copy of the Wakan Sansai Sui? And more importantly, how did they understand the significance of Terajima's version of Hotan's world? Both Klaproth and Remusat were prodigious autodidacts, pioneering bibliographers, voracious and contentious linguists, and founding members of the Society Asiatique. Klaproth was perhaps the more colorful of the two. He was a close friend of Goethe, offered his services to Napoleon, exiled on Elba, and traveled from St. Petersburg to Peking with Count Golovkin's embassy. 
Klaproth taught himself Chinese at the age of 14 and went on to gain expertise in Manchu, Mongolian, Tibetan, Japanese, Sanskrit, Uyghur, Persian, Kurdish, Turkish, Russian, Georgian, and Armenian. He wrote the first European language biography of the Buddha in 1923 and lectured on Xuanzang's travels in 1934. As prodigious a cartographer as he was a linguist, Klaphot published more than 40 maps of Asia using both Chinese and Jesuit sources and drew nearly 400 more in manuscript. Rimusat, whom Stendhal called the most learned man in France, taught himself Chinese at the age of 18. At 26, he was appointed professor of Chinese and Manchu languages at the Collège de France, the first chair in Chinese studies in Europe. Claprot was appointed to the second such chair in Bonn the year later. But after Remusat's appointment, he was tasked with cataloging all of the East Asian books in the Royal Library. It was this commission that introduced him to Terajima's encyclopedia, for which he would later write a 200-page descriptive catalog. A catalog which listed every entry, every illustration, and every map including Terajima's reproduction of Hotan's map, the Western regions and the five regions of India. Rimisat's translation of Fashtan's record was his final and posthumous work, and his friend Klaprot was responsible for the accompanying map of India. Not only did Klaprot redraw every line, translate every place name, and uh, rather transliterate every place name and translate every annotation, including the distances recorded by Xuanzang from Terajima's version of Hotan's map. He added something that did not appear in either Terajima's copy or Hotan's original. He re-inscribed the route of Xuanzang's pilgrimage which was absent from both Hotan's original and Terajima's copy. In re-inscribing Xuanzang's itinerary, Klaprot unwittingly, perhaps, returned the modern printed map to its earlier role of a medieval manuscript. The map of left, which had allowed Japanese monks to travel back across time and place to the land of Buddhist origins, offered early European scholars of Buddhism a similar opportunity. This serves to remind us that the transmission of Buddhism in Asia and beyond is always multiple and multidirectional. Its trajectory neither unitary nor universal. The modern European ancestors of Buddhist studies seem to have led us, much like Xuanzang, full circle. The birth of Buddhist studies in the modern West may not only entail, in Max Weber's famous phrase, quote, the disenchantment of the world, end quote, but also perhaps its re-enchantment as well. And the relationship between the Buddhist scholar and the Buddhist pilgrim may be closer than we think. Thank you very much.